Welcome to chapter two in the human biology textbook. Uh, now, in this chapter, the author introduces us basically to chemistry and the fundamentals of uh, chemical reactions, bonds, and processes that are relevant to biology students. Uh, we're not going to be going on to any kind of uh, detailed discussions as chemistry is a very big, really enormous topic. But in order to understand how cells work, how basic components of cells uh, interact in the body, we do understand. Uh, we have to keep in mind and appreciate how molecules, atoms, and the components inside the cells actually operate, and this is the domain of chemistry. Uh, so essentially, when you think of chemistry, you're thinking of interactions between atoms and molecules, different reactions, uh, and different changes that occur. And chemistry, specifically biochemistry, is an essential component of understanding normal anatomy and physiology of the human body. Now, before we get into any more of those details, Let's kind of step back and think about the universe and everything that we come across in the universe is actually made out of matter. A marker, a non-living thing, an object, anything, whether living or not, consists of some kind of matter. And matter is contained of different molecules and atoms. Remember, atoms are the smallest indivisible units of matter and molecules are when multiple atoms have come together uh, to make a larger structure. Now, there are four main phases of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Uh, of these four, three solid, liquid, and gas are the most important ones that we're gonna discuss here in plasma is really not super relevant to biology, but is still an important component, kind of physics and overall science. Uh, all these states of matter depend on uh, the standard temperature um, and pressure. And so once those change, right, they will essentially uh, either cause one, an object to go from one phase of matter to switch into a different phase uh, and things like that. And we'll talk about what that means. Now, for each of these, we also want to talk about uh, basically two components. One is that what is the molecular structure uh, inside If we can actually see these molecules, what would they look like, what approximately what their appearance would be. And also uh, generally without any special tools, how do we observe, how do we see these different phases? So for instance, if we have something that's a solid, what is a solid? Solid is an object that contains a specified cohesive shape all the time. Uh, all the molecules are arranged in a very specific pattern. Uh, they don't change, right? All the atoms are bonded and connected the same way. And that solid object retains that shape, retains that structure. Uh, again, as long as the temperature and pressure do not change. So something like an ice cube, Right, which we know is water basically that has solidified ice under cold conditions, all those molecules of water, uh, even though they are vibrating to some extent because all atoms and molecules are always vibrating regardless of the phase of matter, uh, they are vibrating much less and they're kind of staying together much more tightly in that packed solid state. And the same is true for all solids. Um, so when you see a solid, again, you know it takes up unified shape and the molecular structure is cohesive uh, in one unified, uniform pattern. If something is liquid, right, again taking that ice cube for instance, if you melt it and it turns into water, right, liquids obviously have a very different molecular shape. There the atoms are moving much faster, colliding against each other, more energy has been provided to them because we've raised the temperature now, and the liquid will take shape of the whatever container it's in. Right? So if you spill a cup of water on your table, uh, the water will just go all over the table, right? If you have a cup and you pour some water into that cup, right? It takes the shape of the uh, of that cup or whatever any other vessel you have. So in the liquid, the difference between the solid is that the molecular structure is less cohesive. There is more movement occurring. The atoms are moving and vibrating much faster. Um, and there's no overall kind of uh, shape to that structure because uh, the liquid takes the shape of the container that it's in. Okay, so obviously in the body, uh, if solid organs were most of the organs of the body, liquid would be something like blood and urine and other body fluids. And for gas, ultimately, right, if you take that water and you boil it in a tea kettle and get water vapor coming out or steam, that would be ultimate change from liquid into gas when the temperature has increased and now the molecules are moving very fast, far away from each other, 
and gas also kind of like liquid will take the shape of the container essentially but if allowed to uh, kind of open up and escape will go essentially rise and go everywhere uh, because it's not bound by uh, kind of any boundaries or constraints so the difference between solid and liquid for gas is that the molecular structure is the least cohesive. The molecules are far apart, moving very quickly from each other. A lot of energy has been supplied there usually. And they definitely uh, do not stay put in any one place unless contained in a specific closed enclosure, like uh, at some kind of a chamber, uh, or like an oxygen tank, let's say, where the oxygen cannot escape because you have closed that tank. And plasma is essentially it's ionized gas, something similar to that, where basically so much energy has been supplied to the gas that now the electrons have been stripped off in high energy reactions of the top levels of the atoms and now have uh, turned that into plasma. Now, um, make sure to look at the book and uh, as you're watching this to kind of follow the notes and uh, what the author is saying in the book to see the illustrations. Uh, the basics, as I keep kind of referring to this, of the atomic structure and molecular structure is that essentially when you think of an atom, you have a nucleus with the protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged, subatomic particles, neutrons are uh, neutral. And then we have at least one electron, which is negatively charged, flying around, right, sort of uh, in that kind of spherical configuration, right? So imagine an atom as a sphere. Uh, all atoms from the smallest hydrogen to the largest natural atom, which is uh, number 92, uranium, all have the same basic configuration. Uh, the only difference is that the higher you go in the atomic size, the larger the nucleus becomes. So you get additional numbers of protons and neutrons added to it, and electron number obviously changes as well as the atoms get greater and greater. When you put multiple atoms together, uh, they bind to each other, they create a bond. There are different kinds of bonds that we're gonna talk about soon. And again, in chemistry, our most important relevance here is that what happens to the electrons? When atoms actually combine and make a bond, those electrons start to interact. When you have a, some kind of chemical change, chemical reaction, even as simple as a color change in a solution uh, or some kind of a change in temperature or anything like that, it's often the electrons that have been moving from one atom to another, from one molecule to another and being exchanged between these different molecules and atoms, that constitutes often the chemical change taking place. And that's the kind of basis of all of chemistry. Again, in chemistry, we care about what happens to the electrons, especially the outer shell electrons uh, in the atom. Now, because there's so many different atoms in the universe, pure atoms in pure form, we categorize in the periodic table of the elements. And I'm sure you have seen these tables and you'll see the copy in the textbook. Basically, this is a very large chart that contains 92 naturally occurring elements. Uh, for this course, we are primarily interested in just a few of these elements, uh, and in biology overall, we're only interested in just a few. So those like hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, calcium, potassium, sodium, um, a few more. These are the primary elements we're gonna be interested in. Uh, the best way to categorize them and the way they're categorized according to the periodic table is whether they are metals or non-metals. Now, even though from basic life we all know what these things are in general, uh, just to remind you, right, metals are those things that are usually conduct electricity well, conduct heat well, uh, have that metallic luster to them, uh, that metal, that, that uh, kind of classic metallic appearance, like you see in gold or silver or nickel, like in coins, uh, and metals are also ductile and malleable uh, and uh, so are extremely important to daily life and are found in different quantities inside our body, for instance, such as like iron or zinc and other elements in our cells. The non-metals on the hand is a bit more complex category, but this is a mix of things that are non-metallic, right? So non-metals often are gases, such as chlorine gas, oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, like we have in the atmosphere. Uh, these non-metals do not conduct electricity as well, are non-malleable, do not conduct heat as well, and have other important properties that are kind of stand them apart from the metals. Uh, so again, when you take a look at the periodic table chart in the book, uh, focus just on these few elements that I mentioned uh, and 
we'll take some of your examples to discuss important aspects of, um, of the chemistry that's relevant in our body. Okay. Uh, one of the basic com uh, molecules we're going to be talking about is water, which is H2O, often portrayed like this. So we have an oxygen, single bonded to a hydrogen, and single bonded to another hydrogen. Right? So this molecule has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. The oxygen atom is much bigger than the hydrogens, um, and also the oxygen, because it's bigger, it has this stronger pull on the electrons from these other atoms. The hydrogens being the first element in the periodic table has only a single hydrogen and one proton inside its nucleus. Now, so how did this molecule form, or sort of how do we have these bonds, these connections? So they have, there are two uh, main chemical bonds that exist, especially relevant in biology. One is a covalent type of bond, and it is an ionic bond. When you think of covalent bonds, essentially thinking about elements that have been bonded in a way where the electrons are shared. In this molecule, for instance, we call this nonpolar covalent, or sorry, rather polar covalent bond because these are different elements. Right? So this is called polar covalent because they create a polarity since oxygen puts on a greater force on the electrons trying to pull them away from the hydrogen atoms. Right? So overall, whether it's polar covalent, uh, when the atoms are different, or non-polar covalent, when they're identical atoms, like in an oxygen gas O2 molecule, all of those are covalent bonds where electrons are shared. These are the most common bonds you're going to see in chemistry, organic chemistry, and overall, most important to the organic molecules found in our body. Uh, when you see an ionic bond, on the other hand, this is a salt bond. Uh, this would be a molecule such as NaCl or sodium chloride. And in this molecule, sodium is a metal, chloride is a nonmetal. When a metal and a nonmetal combine, they make a salt, they create that ionic bond that's easily disrupted by some kind of a solvent, usually water. Right? So when you're drinking, uh, salt water, let's say if you put some salt in a cup of water and you drink it and you feel that saltiness, what your taste buds are actually feeling are the ionized form of these uh, elements, especially the sodium. Right? So in an ionic form, sodium and chloride are separated. If you have pure salt, they have combined as metal and nonmetal. When you put them in a solvent, they dissociate. When they dissociate, they go into their natural state. The natural state for metals is to lose at least one electron, and for non-metals is to gain an electron. So because electrons are negative, when you lose an electron from a metal, they become positively charged molecules. So like Na+. Right? So again, you start with zero charge, you lose an electron because as a metal, that's what you do, based on the rules of the periodic table. As you become sodium ion, positively charged ion, we call this also a cation. And for the chloride, chloride would be negatively charged, right? As a nonmetal, it likes to gain an electron. So it becomes Cl minus or chloride ion, also called an anion. Again, these words cations, anions, do not be confused by them. All they mean is either positively charged or negatively charged atoms. Again, just to summarize this, how would you get to these positively negatively charged? This is essentially in nature, the normal state. If you have a molecule that's a salt, when they dissociate in water, they will separate into these charged molecules or by themselves, keeping in mind for yourself that metals always lose an electron, at least one, and non-metals always gain an electron. Right? So when you subtract a negative, an electron from zero, you get a positive charge. When you add a negative to zero, right, you have a negative charge. Right, that's why we have this. So when you see an atom in that form, positively or negatively charged, we call these electrolytes, also called ions. So if somebody asks you, what's an example of an electrolyte? It's basically any atom that has lost or gained an electron. Again, so this would be a sodium ion, this would be a chloride ion. Again, ions and electrolytes are the same thing. Uh, one way also to remember this is that electrolytes are called like that partially because when charged particles are moving, they actually generate some electrical energy. That's right? something like the word electricity and electrolytes are kind of related like this and so uh, may be helpful to remember.
Now, there are also many other uh, chemical interactions and different types of atoms um, in our body, and that's relevant uh, from a biochemical point of view. But uh, what we want to do is we want to discuss one other important um, aspect of chemistry in the body, and this is acid-base chemistry, and how we identify it, how do we categorize them in the body. Now, we're going to do this with the help of our kind of diagram here which you'll see in the book. So you must have heard that we have uh, in the world things that are called acids and bases, right? Bases also something called it's alkaline. There are many different definitions of acids uh, and bases in chemistry and biology, but we're gonna take the simplest definition is that essentially when you have something, any kind of substance that is giving off hydrogen ions, right? What's a hydrogen ion? Well, it's a hydrogen atom that has lost its only electron, and so it's now a naked proton nucleus. So H plus or hydrogen ion, if this molecule is being donated or given off by a certain substance, we call this an acid. Again, an acid is a molecule that's either giving off or donating hydrogen ions, H plus ions, to other substances. We have called this an acid. And there are many different types of acids that we'll go into very soon as examples, especially those relevant in the body and kind of from a biological point of view. For alkaline things or things that are bases, essentially this is the opposite. A substance that takes H plus from other things, we call this, again, takes H plus away from other things, we call this a base or alkaline. So a base is a substance that instead of giving away H plus like the acid, it, it takes away the H plus from other molecules. And again, there are many examples that we'll go into as well. You just need to know just a couple of examples just to kind of keep that framework in mind uh, to help you uh, when you're doing the homework and reading the book and everything. Now, so um, the most common types of acids, uh, we have some that are found in the body. We categorize them as either strong acids or weak acids. Um, and I'm gonna explain what that means soon. The way we measure how strong or weak something is in terms of acids or bases is using a pH scale. pH stands for the power of hydrogen, or another way of saying is the concentration of hydrogen plus ions in a solution, in that mixture. So the more hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic the substance is. The pH scale is a logarithmic scale that goes from 1 to 14, uh, usually with 7 being pH of neutral, that is essentially distilled uh, regular water, should be pH neutral. Uh, meaning it's neither an acid or a base. And then substances that are more acidic are below seven on the pH scale. So pH six, five, four, three, two, one. These are all acidic substances becoming more and more acidic or strong acids as they go further away from seven towards one. And substances that are alkaline or basic are again, are above seven or greater than seven on the pH scale an increase in the pH value, so 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. These are all alkaline substances, and the more basic, more alkaline they become, the stronger the base, the further away from 7 they are. What are the common acids and bases you should be familiar with? So for acids, hydrochloric acid, this is the, one of the most common types of acid, just very simple, two molecules, one atom of hydrogen bounded to one atom of chloride. This is the same hydrochloric acid you see in your stomachs that helps you digest food and it'll eliminate dangerous particles. Uh, so gastric acid, stomach acid is hydrochloric acid. It's often also used in research in laboratories for experiments for students and in industry. This is a very, very strong acid at around pH one or two, depending on how concentrated it is. Other common acids like you see in vinegar, such as acetic acid, citric acid in citrus fruits like lemons and limes. Uh, and even something like tomatoes, and again, many, many other acids you familiar with, like sulfuric acid, battery acid, and so on. Again, do not worry about trying to name every single acid. You won't be able to because there's too many of them. Uh, main idea here is just keep in mind the definition of an acid and come up with basic examples. Again, like acetic acid from vinegar, hydrochloric acid, and so on. Again, remember, acids are the ones donating the hydrogen plus ions. And for bases, again, remember bases were accepting the H plus ions from uh, substances. And here, the most common one, strong bases, would be something like 
NaOH sodium hydroxide, KOH potassium hydroxide, NH3, which is ammonia, and so on. NaOH, KOH could be found in lye or as an uh, active ingredient in something like Drano to clean out the pipes, or basically uh, many other substances used either for cleaning purposes or uh, even in soaps, detergents, things like that. Uh, so keep in mind, right, as a strong base, NHKH would be closer to 13 or 14. If it's a weaker base, so ammonia could be relatively weak, could be around 9 or 10. Uh, and again, closer to 7 you get, the weaker the acid of the base becomes. Uh, so as an example for acid, something that I didn't mention, if HCl is around 1 or 2, something would be around 5 or 6, weaker acid. Might be something like citric acid or weakened acetic acid like in vinegar. And it depends on concentrations in the situation. Again, keep in mind this is a logarithmic scale. What that means is that every time you move one digit on the scale, you actually move in magnitude of 10. So if you compare two substances, let's say something that is pH 5 and pH 7, how much greater or more acidic is the substance that's pH 5 from pH 7? The difference is that, so you have to multiply. You have 10 multiplied by 10. So a substance that is pH 5 is actually 10 multiplied by 10, 100, right? So 100 times more acidic than substance that's neutral, that's pH 7. Let's go the other way. Let's say you have something that's pH 10 and pH 7. How much more basic or alkaline is substance that's pH 10 versus pH 7? Right? First, we have to agree, of course, is that is pH 10 greater or more alkaline substance than pH 7? Yes. Right, we're just looking at the scale. How much greater? Well, let's multiply. So 10 multiplied by 10 multiplied by 10. So that's 1,000, right? So that means a base that is pH 10 versus another base that's pH 7 would be 1,000 times more basic than this other substance. Okay, so this is a very important concept to understand, again, because this is a logarithmic scale, we move very quickly by magnitude of 10, and you always multiply these magnitudes of the concentration of hydrogen ions, okay, to get the final value. Um, now, so again, in the book, you'll see the scale, you'll see more comparisons and more sort of different examples. Keep in mind, at the very least, the examples that I'm talking about, right, you don't have to read out, uh, write out the full names of these. Just remembering KOH and NOH as bases uh, or acids like here is enough. Again, uh, that's the acceptable abbreviations in chemistry. Now, the last part here, part four in this chapter, uh, can talk about uh, some molecules that will be coming back throughout the semester. These are the basic organic molecules of life. Uh, there are four main categories of these molecules. We have carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. I'm sure you have heard of some of these molecules even from nutrition or reading labels on foods and things like that from basic life. But overall, uh, from a chemistry point of view and especially point of view of biology, uh, we want to identify what kind of examples of the molecules uh, exist, what are these molecules, uh, and how are we going to come across them in the body. So carbohydrates are your basic sugars, also called monosaccharides or polysaccharides, depending on how uh, many subunits of the molecules exist. Uh, but essentially, we can just call them carbohydrates or sugars. Uh, these molecules should be familiar to you as basic starch from plants, glucose, lactose from milk, maltose, and other similar sounding names. If you have an OSE at the end, that's usually some kind of a simple carbohydrate there. Uh, so sucrose from sugar uh, that you can buy in a store, glucose, fructose, other molecules like that. These are all molecules that provide us with instant energy. All carbohydrates provide energy to the body. Not all carbohydrates can be easily digested by humans uh, or by us, right? but they are essentially sources of energy for us. Uh, glycogen is basically uh, the glucose form stored in the liver as this uh, um, polymer of glucose, basically multiple subunits of glucose that the liver is holding in cases of uh, when you're fasting or haven't had any meals for a while, but the body still requires glucose molecules as energy source, so glycogen can put into good use by cleaving off some of the glucose 
uh, molecules individually from there and allowing them to go into the bloodstream. Again, when you think of carbohydrates, you're thinking of sugars, monosaccharides, polysaccharides, providing energy to the body. The next set of molecules is the proteins, very large category. These are very large, big, complex molecules uh, consisting of amino acids, multiple subunits of these. There are around 20 amino acids that exist, things like thinking of alanine, glycine, tryptophan, glutamate, uh, histidine, and others. You don't have to know the individual names, but keep in mind that, again, these individual small molecules make up a larger protein. Proteins come in different shapes, sizes, and configurations. Usually the best way to think about them is think of proteins as structural components, but also have other very important uh, functions in the body. So if you think of a structural component of protein, you can think of proteins found inside cells that provide the integrity to the cell, the basic structure. You think of something like keratin, which is the consistency uh, for um, the main ingredient in hair and nails, right? provides that protective layer for the top layer of the skin of the epidermis and is found again in hair and nails. So that's keratin, it's a kind of a common structural protein. Other types of proteins could be carrier molecules that carry, let's say, oxygen, like uh, hemoglobin or albumin in the blood. Uh, some proteins are even more complex and bigger, and these undergo multiple chemical reactions and allow, actually, to act as a catalyst for chemical reactions. We call these enzymes in biology, right? So, these enzymes, regardless of what they're doing in the body, are always proteins, uh, primarily as well. Sometimes hormones could be uh, made out of proteins as well. Example would be something like uh, insulin, basically, the important molecule that uh, is necessary to uh, control levels of glucose in the body and make sure that the glucose is taken up by cells. Again, we'll encounter many different types of proteins. Um, this is not something where you have to worry about the molecular shape or anything like that. Sometimes you will see these structures in the book, but overall, keep in mind the name and where it's, this protein functions or what kind of job it's doing is very important. So again, thinking of proteins not as providing energy usually for us, but providing us with either structure or important functional characteristics such as those involved in enzymes or hormones or other molecules like that. The third category are lipids. Lipids are basically thinking of fatty acids, triglycerides, cholesterol, things like that. These are molecules that also provide us with energy, but usually energy that could be attained either as long-term energy provision or later on. So somewhat similar to the carbohydrates, but carbohydrates usually think of immediate source of energy, while lipids are uh, a little bit more complex storage of energy, something that could be used by the body potentially later on or have actually other functions. Uh, again, best example of lipids for us would be cholesterol, because cholesterol not only is this something that people think about when their arteries are clogged with cholesterol, uh, uh, but also it's actually an important component of cell membrane, allows the cell membrane to be, uh, it's has that, have that dynamic and uh, very important kind of um, fluid structure. And when we talk about cell membrane, you know, you know, uh, We'll, we'll go into more of those details. But cholesterol actually functions as the basis for the formation of many hormones in the body, the steroid hormones, such as testosterone, estrogens, and many others. And the last type of molecule, or the last category of these molecules, is the nucleic acids. And these are the molecules that hold the genetic information in the body. So thinking about like deoxyribonucleic acids, or DNA, and ribonucleic acids, like the RNA, DNA, RNA are essential for keeping the genetic code intact to allow the genetic code to be transcribed and read and understood by the cells. Again, make sure you are reviewing all of this information in chapter two in our human biology textbook and follow the notes and uh, directions in Blackboard.